Italy entered the war in June of 1941. Its first target became the British-held island of Malta. This tiny rock in the Mediterranean was the most bombed country of World War II. But the Maltese were not going to give in, nor were the British. Tony Spooner was an RAF pilot on Malta. This is where he met the enemy, on the battlefront. As 1940 begins, Italy's fascist leader Benito Mussolini is incensed because the British control the nearby island of Malta. This outpost is over a thousand miles from the nearest British bases at Gibraltar in the west and Alexandria in the east, but it is only 50 miles from Sicily. Malta gives England control of the Mediterranean, and in 1940, the British are at war with Italy's ally, the Germans. On June 11, one day after Italy enters the war, Mussolini unleashes his bombers on Malta. One RAF pilot who is stationed in Malta is Tony Spooner. I was there for, I think it was about 1,250 air raids. Not everyone was a serious air raid. Many of them were just reconnaissance flights. But we were bombed on average about three or four times every day. The Italians used rather antiquated aircraft, and they weren't particularly well protected by armor, and they tended to turn tail at the first sign of any opposition. I was in coastal command, and our job in Malta was to go out at night and find the ships that were trying to transport supplies from Italy and Sicily to Rommel's forces in North Africa. And having found them, our job then was to home other people to come and attack them, and occasionally attack them ourselves. Well, the population took it very well, bearing in mind it wasn't even their war. As far as possible, the routine went on. It was business as usual to the extent that you could do business as usual. The bars kept open as long as they possibly could, but of course we eventually ran out of beer and everything else nearly. But it was pretty grim food. It was all tin food or whatever they could find. While the Maltese go about their daily business, they learn to live with the constant air raids from the ineffective and ill-equipped Italian Air Force. You get used to it like everything else. It's pretty frightening at first, but then you see other people are paying no attention to it, and in the end, you start paying no attention to it. The Maltese show no signs of giving in, and British anti-aircraft fire wears down Mussolini's pilots. The Italian aerial bombardment of Malta is a failure, partly because the planes themselves have small bomb loads, and partly because the Italian bombs aren't very good. Partly, the Italian bombers have trouble hitting their target in the face of an anti-aircraft defense, which, while its initial stage is not all that formidable, is still more flock than the Italians have ever faced before. British submarines and seaplanes emerge around Malta and constantly torpedo Axis supply vessels on their way to North Africa. This activity is becoming a thorn in the side of the Germans and an embarrassment to the Italians. In January 1941, Hitler sends an entire German air fleet, which has been called back from the Russian front and moved to Sicily. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring is given control of 2,000 top-rate aircraft Kesselring's mission is to gain control of the air and sea between South Italy and North Africa. Each adversary had a slightly different reason for wanting this particular piece of rock. As the attacks go on, Malta becomes a symbol for both sides. Uh, it's been called uh, the Mediterranean Verdun. The struggle for Malta took on an importance that had nothing to do with the actual utility of the island. 
In many ways, the German air forces who go after Malta are at the peak of their effectiveness. They've been operating in Europe and in the Mediterranean since the beginning of the war. The crews are well trained, very experienced, and jumping high morale. And this is particularly true of the, the bomber wings, who have had it mostly their own way since coming to the Mediterranean. They faced very little effective fighter opposition from the British. And so they are confident in their ability to soften up Malta, not least because they see this as a good way of showing up the Italians. There's a swagger in the Luftwaffe's approach here. Again, the crews aren't specially trained, but they've received ordinary Luftwaffe training by and large, which is very, very good. Until the Germans came along, we went at the smallest bit frightened of the Italians. But the Germans had dive bombers, and they were far more determined. And it was a different story altogether. And they achieved complete air superiority over the island at one time. To their credit, they really bombed targets, although, of course, when chased by fighters, they often jettisoned their bombs on other places. And so the bombing was concentrated upon four areas. One was the port area and the three airfields. So everything in adjacent to the port, which was a highly populated area, was flattened, and everything on and around the airfields was flattened. By December, you've got over a thousand air raids mounted by aircraft which are fast enough and maneuverable enough to elude ground defenses and shake up ground fire. Uh, the German Dornier, uh, Heinkel, and the uh, Junkers 88, they call them medium bombers, we call them light medium bombers, are fast, maneuverable, uh, take punishment well. And so, it becomes harder and harder to bring them down. And a Malta anti-aircraft defense that depends heavily on local volunteers is beginning to wonder, well, what's it take to get these guys? December 1941, the 1,000 Axis raids on Malta has not brought the island any closer to a surrender. Only 15 miles long, Malta becomes the most heavily bombed target in the world. The Germans in particular would bomb around the clock or as near to it as makes no difference, the nights of the full moon. And that could mean doing as many as six sorties a day, that is, taking off and landing. The norm was rather a two a day, because uh, the uh, bases in Italy and Sicily were a good long way away, and it was a fairly demanding flight. It did put very high physical and psychological strains on the crew. German air crew flew the, the Malta runs would say that you could hear the engines hammering long after you got out of the plane back at your home base, uh, that your body would be twitching to the rhythms of the plane when you try to lie down and sleep. This took a toll of physical and emotional health, but above all, it was the sense of having to go back day after day after day and do the same thing. 
this was a good way to go mad, particularly because, unlike the American system, the Germans did not allow for relieving crews and pilots after a certain number of missions. Psychologically, they're poorly equipped for the kind of war of attrition that increasingly, with nobody really liking the idea, becomes the norm over all. On April 17, 1942, the embattled island of Malta wins a decoration for bravery. King George VI awards the island the Order of the George Cross. But the award ceremony is cut short by the arrival of yet another Axis bombing. The George Cross is one of the rarest medals in the world, and it was an outstanding feat of valor when you were not in the service. Now, King George has always been very interested in Malta, and when he heard that the island was being subjected to so much bombing and privation, he had the very bright idea of giving a special George Cross to the island. And it's the only case, I think, of a medal being given to a piece of territory rather than to an individual. There are now only eight British aircraft operating against some 15 Axis squadrons. Malta desperately needs fighter planes to regain control of its airspace. There is not a single British aircraft carrier available for the urgent mission. English Prime Minister Winston Churchill makes a desperate appeal to the United States. Will the response be in time to save Malta? In April 1942, the American carrier Wasp brings British Spitfires into the Mediterranean. The only way of getting the fight with the Malta was to put them on board an aircraft carrier and get the aircraft carrier within about 500 miles of Malta and then fly them off the decks. As soon as the Spitfires arrive, German radar alerts the Axis air fleet at Sicily. The Luftwaffe strikes and destroys or disables every one of the planes. On the same day, British intelligence learns that an airborne invasion from Sicily is imminent. Meanwhile, German and Italian troops on Sicily are preparing for the airborne invasion of Malta. Hitler and Mussolini agree on a date for the Axis assault, early June. By now, Malta has been under steady aerial siege for 23 months. The British no longer have airplanes and very little ammunition left. We had a limited number of anti-aircraft guns and to the extent possible, um, it was very hard to get supplies to Malta at all. They were rationed to only fire bombers, not fighters. The one resource which keeps the casualty rate low is the island's excellent shelters. Since Malta is made of limestone, the caverns provide protection for the Maltese. The rock is very soft, and there were a great number of shelters, and they made a great number more. And the Maltese took it remarkably well. They took it just the way that the, the Londoners took it. And they just put up with every privation with a shrug of the shoulders and, and, and said, we'll carry on. But basically, the bombing turned the whole thing round. Any thought of, of giving in after they've been bombed, well, same as, as happened in London. Any thought of giving in after you've bombed, you don't give in. Bombing has a reverse effect. In early May 1942, the USS Wasp and the British carrier Eagle return and successfully deliver a replacement squadron of 64 Spitfires within flying range of Malta. But this time, we'd learned from the errors of first time. The first lot all landed at Takali, which is the fighter airfield, and, and they were very largely written off on the ground. This time they split them between the three airfields. It made sense. And they had them all in the air in about 15 minutes after arriving. The Spitfires are refueled and airborne in minutes as German bombers approach. They meet the Junkers and Messerschmitts head on over the airfield. The Luftwaffe gets more than it bargains for. 37 German planes are lost. The British only lose three. This second operation 
is the turning point of the air campaign because they achieve a victory by blowing away the first 47. Now, here are 60 odd more, and the Luftwaffe pilots and their commanders are beginning to think, what do the armies and Brits do? You know, pull them out of hats. British intelligence learns that Axis troops scheduled to invade Malta have been diverted to the Panzer Army in North Africa. The invasion of Malta will not take place. Malta continues to be dependent on the outside world for such things as grain, meat, and gasoline. The Germans commence starvation tactics. When it becomes apparent that the Italian, the Italian Air Force can't establish superiority, the Army says, we're not going to risk a parachute division on a suicide mission, and the Navy says, we can't cover an amphibious landing. So the Germans continue what amounts to an attritional campaign of wearing Malta down by starvation. In June, British convoys attempt to reach the island from both Gibraltar and Alexandria. Of 115 Allied vessels, only two get through. Until German planes committed to Malta are required elsewhere on the Russian front in the Western Desert, they continue an increasingly futile pattern of bombing an island that most historians agree was not that important. The rationing of supplies takes its toll as morale sinks. Community kitchens barely feed a fraction of the population. I seem to remember the price of, a, of an egg in those days, a black market egg was up to about three shillings which is equivalent to about 10 pounds a day or something. The situation in Malta is becoming critical if supply ships are unable to break through the Axis obstacles. Unknown to the Maltese or the British forces on the island, the English government is unable to agree on whether to defend Malta or surrender. The war cabinet was prepared to give up Malta, apart from Churchill. On paper, the island was completely undefendable. You can actually see Sicily on, on a fine day. Building on Churchill's stubbornness, one final convoy carrying the last hope of relief for Malta leaves England. 14 merchant ships carrying over 120,000 tons of supplies are escorted by four aircraft carriers, 40 destroyers, two battleships, and 12 cruisers. But the reinforced convoy is too big to conceal from the Germans. August 10th, Malta's savior fleet enters the Mediterranean. Converging against it, a powerful German-Italian force spearheaded by 21 submarines and 540 aircraft. August 12th, the Axis air attack hits in full force. British carrier planes and concentrated ACAC fire again keep the attackers away from the merchant ships. But finally, 40 Stuka bombers go into a power dive through the barrage. 
By evening, both fleet and convoy reach a narrow channel to the harbor where protective battleships and carriers cannot follow because of limited sea room. The merchant ships must try to squeeze into the port with only a skeleton escort. The Germans seize the last opportunity to attack. Torpedoes hit their mark and take a toll on the convoy. Five bombed merchant ships limp into the harbor at Malta. They bring food, but no gasoline. The tanker Ohio, an American ship with an all-British crew, carries the gasoline that's Malta's sole hope for survival. Heavily damaged, the slowly sinking tanker staggers into harbor with its precious cargo. Malta has survived its darkest hour. After the operations at Malta, Tony Spooner would be a flight instructor and later serve as a coastal command officer in the invasions on D-Day. What Malta did, almost 80% by our submarines in Malta, we sank and damaged enough supply ships to keep Rommel short of fuel in particular and of everything else, because like us, he had to have everything brought in. Even dimly at the time, I think we all realized the significance of Malta some more than others. But I'm quite certain in my own mind I could never have been Alamey without Malta. The rocky island of Malta proves to be the most important factor for British victory in North Africa, hastening defeat for the Germans and making the Mediterranean a British patrolled territory.